Bueno, muy buenas tardes a todos y todas. Damos inicio a la audiencia número 16 de 100. Good afternoon, everyone. We will start our 16th hearing of this period of sessions, which is called the situation of human rights of women and young girls in the context of the protests in Mexico and was requested by a series of organizations from the civil society. I'm Yulisa Mantilla, the first vice president of the Inter-American Commission. I am joined by the second vice president, Flavia Piovesan, and Commissioner Esmeralda Arrosemeno, the country rapporteur and rapporteur for the rights of children. We also have the Deputy Secretary for Monitoring and the uh, Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression. I would like to greet the organization, the representatives of the Mexican state, and Mr. Uh, Guillermo Fernandez Maldonado, the representative of the UN. First, we would like to uh, say a couple of things. We have a digital tool in our platform that will be measuring time. Also, we have bilingual interpretation and uh, subtitling, and we will be broadcasting or streaming on several social uh, media. We will begin with 20 minutes for the civil society. Then uh, I will ask you to introduce yourselves as you speak. Then the state will speak for 20 minutes. Then Mr. Fernandez Maldonado for seven minutes. And then we will start 20 minutes for the commission. And then we will go on with the hearing. So let's begin with the civil society for 20 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, honorable commissioners. Mr. Rapporteur for the Freedom of Expression, members of the Executive Secretariat of the Commission, representatives from the High Commissioner of the UN, and representatives from the civil society and representatives from the Mexican state. My name is Norma Gonzalez Benitez. I'm from Amnesty International. I am joined by Lucia Lagunes, Sofia de Roina Castro and Carla Ines Rios from the Frente por la Libertad de Expresión y Protesta Social, Giselle Yañez from the Mexican Commission for the Defense of Human Rights, and Alejandra Manabella from Centro por la Justicia y el Derecho Internacional. We will be presenting on this hearing on the situation of women and girls within the context of the um, uh, protests in Mexico. In different parts of Mexico, activists and women have been demanding the state to act to prevent and eradicate gender-based violence. And we have also been demanding fighting impunity in cases of femicide, transfemicide, and other violences. In spite of that, the Mexican state response has been um, violence and stigmatizing discourse, stating that they are conservative movements to um, dismiss the movements and ignoring international standards on the use of force, committing violations to uh, human rights, as we will point out in this hearing. Now I will give the floor to Giselle Yanez. Thank you. Now we will talk about the laws that restrict or criminalize social protest and the militarization as an inhibitor in the defense of human rights the legislative branch and the local powers have issued several reforms that seek to criminalize the right to social protest. Last December, a reform was passed to Article 533 of the law for the media that punishes those who block railway railroads. On March 2021, the Guevara Cruz Congress reformed its criminal code with the um, crime of aggression to authority. The reform and the uh, widening of criminal uh, categories that are associated to protests generates um, the use, the, uh, the misuse of criminal law, which is concerning within a complex context for women, in particular, for those who protest in the defense of their rights and against feminicide violence. Mexico has a protecting mechanism for human rights defenders and journalists. Nevertheless, uh, it has no human and financial resources to uh, carry out preventive and proactive actions that are coordinated and efficient. Besides, it has proven to be inefficient to follow up on the communications and risk events. So 
within the context of protests for gender violence, this has affected the um, measures to generate healthy environments for the protection of women who are, dif are manifesting, who are protesting. Now I will give the floor to Sofia da Robina Castro. Thank you very much. With regards to the militarization and the use of force in protests, in 2019, national law on the use of force was uh, sanctioned, which applies to all public safety institutions, including the armed forces. And even though its publication was relevant, some of its articles go against international standards, like enabling lethal force against protests that are considered illicit or violent, which prove, which leads to discretionality by the security forces and inhibits and restricts the rights to meet, to protest, because of its ambiguous language, which generalizes protests. But also another thing we find concerning is that the controls established by this legislation, both internal and external, are not enough because no report, no detailed reports are published on the use of force. Internal investigations don't lead to sanctions. There's a resistance to um, investigate those responsible. Apart from that, there's a lack of um, adequate controls uh, on those who abuse their force. That, of course, leads to restrictions in accountability on the abuses of force as the ones that occurred on women protests as was uh, established by the commission. No measures has been, have been established as the uh, an observatory to monitor the use of force, which was ruled by the commission. Finally, the coexistence between the lack of controls and the alarming rates of gender-based violence are inhibitant, and they actually um, make women fear actual protest. I will talk about the violation of the right to peaceful meeting and freedom of expression with an emphasis on the stigmatization of social protest and digital harassment. Protests headed by women, even though they are mostly peaceful, are beginning to be stigmatized as violent in our country. Authorities have focused on visibilizing uh, interventions on monuments and glass breaking as if they all protests were like that, thus um, affecting the right to meet of women, facilitating that both authorities and particulars and private citizens use their force, both physically and digitally. For example, on the latest protest for the decriminalization of abortion last September 28th, the following day, President Lopez Obrador pointed out that the movement is trying to affect his, move, his government and has accused it of uh, responding to interests who oppose his government. He says, oh, we need to see what's behind this, because two years ago, when the, the feminist movement started par uh, participating, many women took part, but they started to realize that they had become conservative feminists only to fight us, only with that purpose. Um, they point out the um, threats in the official discourse that, uh, have, that uh, social organizations suffered for um, protecting protesters that are feminist. This hostile environment allows these violations to increase with each protest. Also, they strengthen gender stereotypes like those that have to do with uh, women needing to stay at home so that they won't uh, run into trouble with the authorities by protesting and defending their human rights. With that, within that context, the digital environment, which is now crucial for the promotion of these meetings, has also been used to stigmatize and um, um, attack protesters. And many women around the country have reported digital harassment by third parties who address them uh, with sex sexual and physical threats, even death threats. Uh, an organ a feminist organization, Luchadora, has documented simultaneous attacks by organized groups on the internet who go against their 
a discourse of defense to the right to protest. It is clear that the stigmatization of feminist groups by the official discourse in terms of new forms of protests has also increased virtual hatred on the media. Digital aggressions usually occur during commemorative events that are uh, important for the defense of the rights of women like March 8th, November 25th, or September 28th. And many a time, these uh, threats became a reality. It is clear that the state of Mexico has not um, let, has not allowed a healthy space for these protests. Now I will give the floor to Carla Inés Rios. Thank you. During 2020 and 2021, these organizations have documented police repression in manifestations led by women in at least 10 states of the Republic. Aguascalientes, Sinaloa, Quintana Roo, Puebla, Guanajuato, Jalisco, Chiapas, Mexico State, and Mexico City. And they all have something in common. During the detentions and the transfer, transfers of these women, many of them, including children, suffered sexual, psychological, and physical violence based on stereotypes. After that, they were criminally charged. The uh, organizations that are requesting this hearing believe that the disproportionate use of the force, in particular sexual violence against women and the undue use of criminal law, are um, show the lack of compliance of the state with international law. And they are trying to um, criminalize them for being between inverted quotes, uh, between quotes, bad women, because they think that women should stay at home and not in the public sphere. They believe women are passive beings, not holders of rights. Now we will show a video that gathers the voices of some of the women who have suffered um, this repression for fighting for their rights. After that, Alejandra Manavella will present our petitions. Repression and violence chaos. On March 8, 2021, there were protests led by women in different states of the Republic. Three months later, three, three months after participating in the March, three um, several women disappeared, were detained. They didn't even have an arrest warrant. They didn't even read my rights. They just took me, they handcuffed me. And I know the state owes me more than they what they think I owe them. I, I am not at fault for anything, and they have been pressuring me so that I will uh, take the fault for something that I did not do. A judge uh, exonerated Ariana for failures in the investigation. My situation, my psychological situation has been affected, of course. I had I suffered depression and anxiety before this, but this uh, triggered it and made it worse. I have been in a critical situation. I was actually institutionalized at a psychiatric institution where I had to stay for a couple of days because they were afraid I would try to take my life again, because I, I tried to do that. So I would like reparation for that damage. Protests in Quintana Roo. During the protest, police officers fired against the protesters. I climbed on my bike and my boyfriend tried to leave, but a police officer uh, tried to block his way. He faced us. Another two officers were behind us shooting at us. Uh, my theory is that that is when uh, those were the shots I received because they were closer to me and when we were lying on the grass four police officers apart from the new ones started beating us 
with their um, with their weapons, cursing us, saying, uh, saying, oh, you wanted to protest? That's what you get for going onto the streets. I thought that was the worst of it, but no, it wasn't. Because this year of impunity has been the worst. They mock us, they, we were about seeing them being tried, but nothing happened. On May 2021, a group of students gathered in Mendoza. They were asking exams to be on site and not online. 93 people were detained, 74 of them were women. They were accused of theft, violence, and other crimes. Several students were um, suffered sexual attacks. They didn't want to talk, they just wanted to repress us. They, even, they didn't even tell us why. Many of us were just there there was 95 of us, so they said that um, uh, father, parents would no longer try to find 43 students who disappeared. Now it would be 95. They would say that over and over again. That was going to happen to us. They were going to make us disappear. And that has left a mark on me and many of my colleagues the fact that they cannot sleep because we see those images, we remember, it takes us back to all of that. We cannot go out to the street at peace because anyone could attack us and not just criminals, but someone who abused their power, who abuses their power. So that has affected our lives, I believe. For all we've said, we ask this commission first to monitor the mobilizations led by women in our country, as well as the previous and the subsequent environment, and to make, um, uh, to make a st statement in terms of free speech, privacy, and a life free of violence for all protesters. Second, that it will make a statement about what comes against the human rights in terms of the use of violence and the use of external supervision of the security forces. Third, that it will go back to analyzing the legal aspects that are still ongoing in the Commission about this topic. Fourth, that it will urge the Mexican state to acknowledge the legitimacy of these protests led by women and abstain from stigmatizing its participants, whether it is physically or virtually, to investigate seriously and deeply and with the gender perspective, the violations that women have experienced when participating of these protests, to abstain from the unduly use of criminal law against women and children and young girls who are in the protest, and that it will take care of the use of force that the police is using in terms of control, mainly after the implementation of the independent op observatory for the follow-up of policies for accountability issues and monitoring of the use of force by the National Guard sent by the Ibero-American court that it will ensure human rights in terms of citizens' rights, in particular complying with the international standards so that we can go from a militarized model to a model that will strengthen the civil institutions and peace creation. And finally, that it will build together with the three levels of the government and the different parts of the public spheres, civil organizations and regional organizations of human rights, creating a roadmap to strengthen the protection mechanism for defenders, advocates and journalists, and creating public pol a public policy to ensure the right, uh, the human rights and freedom of expression with gender, um, gender based. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much to all the organizations. And now I'll give the floor to the state for 20 minutes. Thank you, Madam Commissioner, Vice President. Good afternoon to you all, distinguished members, participants. 
commissioners. Thank you all very much and the rapporteur, Mr. Guillermo Fernandez as well. I would like to thank the organizations of the civil society that requested this hearing and the commission for giving us this valuable space for dialogue. Same as in other as other times, we hope that we'll be able to identify cooperation opportunities in order to strengthen the institutional response in terms of the securities and ensuring the protections, thus protecting human rights more effectively for all people in Mexico. As part of the delegation, uh, Marela Mariela Reltran is here, the Director for Human Rights of the Public Secretariat for Security and Citizens Protection, Madame Fabiola Alani, Head of the Association to Eradicate Women, Violence Against Women, and the President of Elin Mujeres. So I will give the floor to them now to participate in the order that I have that I have identified with a maximum time of 20 minutes. You can take the floor. Thank you. Por favor, Almadelia Arriola. Almadelia Arriola, can you switch on your mic? Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, commissioners and representatives of the civil organizations that are present here, the Mexican state acknowledges public security as a right and not as a social control practice, which is expressed in the willingness of the Mexican government to strengthen all the institutions that are part of it, and so as to ensure the respect of all human rights, the gender perspective, and the non-discrimination principles. The Mexican government acknowledges and ensures in Article 6 of the Constitution, the right to free manifestation or protests. So it is our duty to safeguard the security of our population and their right to make a protest, as well as the freedom to join and to make manifestation of ideas and opinions. The Mexican Republic is a federal state made up by 32 federations or federative institutions that are sovereign and which have their own or forces of order. Those entities are integrated by municipalities and in some cases, they also have their own police forces. The different government levels can coexist with the federal government. And that's why under this organization, the professionalization of the security forces requires an efficient articulation within that context and with a gender perspective, a non-discrimination and equality principle and taking into full consideration the human rights, the Secretariat for Citizens Protection has designed trainings and protocols in order to improve the performance of the security forces in the country, giving training courses at a national level, as well as for federative and municipal entities in a coordinated manner with the different authorities and safety of authorities. The goal of those trainings is to improve the performance of the people that are part, the members of the safe security forces, so as to create a state that fosters peace, uh, fostering dialogue and reconciliation, especially in terms of training, I would like to point out the following actions. A virtual workshop called Best Practices in Terms of Gender, held in 2020, which benefited people who are public officials and who were who are working in issues related to gender and with, who belong to 23 federative institutions, as well as staff of the National Guard and of this secretariat. There are training courses for staff that are just hired veterans and with hybrid modality, who's, which has a curricula based on gender, human rights, and the use of force. On the other hand, because of the 
celebration of the framework agreement between the government of Mexico and the office of the High Commissioner of the UN for Human Rights to provide assistance, technical assistance for training in terms of human rights according to the international standards on human rights. This training will be provided to the National Guard there have been work meetings where we organized the review of the curricula and of the profile of the teachers for each of the subjects. We also conducted 140 ac academic activities with public officials in topics related to human rights, gender equality and non-discrimination in order to raise awareness and to improve their performance and their efficacy. In particular, I would like to mention the training strategy, the ongoing training strategy for the National Guard that is guided under three essential pillars. First, a differentiation aspect that shows that you need to train according to the responsibility and the role of each public official. Second, responsibility of each public official applicability so that the training in human rights can go hand in hand with the practice. And finally, transversality, which implies that the norms of human rights are integrated at all levels in this training. The documents where we base the training for these security forces, such as conceptual manuals and implementation manuals, protocols, etc try to identify gender topics, the features of the system, gender and sex, and their relation with the social cultural context, so as to create gender-based actions that enable us to foster an equality culture within the institution and outside our institution as well. On February 25th, 2021, the Security and Citizen Protection Secretariat showed a map for peace building in social protests. They acknowledged that Mexico is a country of men and women who are free to show their ideas, to get together and to express themselves in the way in which they decide to do so. At that time, the government of Mexico reaffirmed its commitment to eradicating discrimination and criminalization of social protests and ensuring the freedom of expression without affecting the rights of third people, of third parties, and not promoting war or hatred. This guide shows that the right for manifestation, expression, and getting together is not conditional, and it tries to avoid the use of public forces in order to oppress or to affect the people who are expressing their ideas in a peaceful manner. Therefore, the government of Mexico will safeguard the physical integrity, the goods and the safety of the people who are manifesting or who are in the protest. Third, this guide was presented within the framework of an interinstitutional group for the strategy against violence to women, girls and adolescents, where the leader of the secretariat urged the government to use the contents of this document in all the actions that would be conducted in compliance with the national law about the use of force. On January 20, 21st, 2021, the national protocol about the use of force was published, which is a document by means of which some principles are set to establish the different levels of the use of force, as well as the actions and the behaviors that the security forces or force personnel need to use. Finally, in order to include the gender perspective as an essential element to promote equality among women and men within the institution and outside of this institution, on May 21st this year, 
by an official circular um, communication, a gender committee was created so that issues to be addressed within the secretariat can be actually addressed with a gender perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I will ask Mr. Magali to participate, bearing in mind that we only have 11 minutes left for her and for the subsequent speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, commissioners and members, representatives of the civil society, the government of Mexico by means of the National Commission to Eradicate Violence Against Women is coordinating these actions, actions of the three different entities of the government in terms of care, sanction and er eradication of violence against women, and it is following up on each case. The case of Naomi Quetzali Rojas, which took place in November 2020, was condemned by the COMABI, by our commission, the same day that it happened. The then secretary, Olga Sanchez Cordero, told the commission that they needed to develop an action plan aimed at the police of Quintana Roo, of Cancun, where the facts, the events took place. On February 28th, 2021, there was a work meeting between the CONAVIB, the governor, Carlos Manuel Guajín González, and the uh, attorney general of Quintana Roo's of Quintana Roo, where the main topic was the alert uh, for the alert mechanism for gender violence. We asked the authorities that women who experienced violence in this kind of protests, protests that took place because of a feminicide that took place in that city, were addressed with a gender-based perspective and taking into account the constitution. Bearing in mind what the civil society said, the CONAVIM made a, an awareness training course called the police police actions with a human rights and gender perspective which was conducted from august 16 to august the 20th and was aimed at people from that municipality where 384 people participated subsequently a new group of people that were public officials as well took this training and underwent this training in october from october 4th to october 8th to give a new total amount of police members that were already trained. The design of this course was made with the participation of the police itself, a group of feminists who belong to the Quintana Roo Feminist Network, as well as women from the regional academia. Commissioners, this entity of the government secretariat is working in order to ensure freedom of expression of women, and full enjoyment of their rights. We are against criminalizing protests and we are empath emphatic with the manifestations and protests of women. We've held and we insist on this. These rights are very relevant for our organization and they need to be, and they are insured in the Mexican constitution. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. And now I'll give the floor to Dr. Gaston Magno. Good afternoon, commissioners, colleagues of different organizations from the civil society. The National Institute of Women can acknowledge, acknowledges the importance of listening to the demands of women and young girls as an essential tool in order to move forward in the respect of their rights. Now we have women present here and members of the COMAVIB. And by means of a joint communication on November 23rd, 2020, we conducted, we made a call for all security forces, both at a municipal and state level, might provide necessary protection to women and girls in any manifestation for their rights. In this sense, Eli Mujeres, 
works together with the Citizens Protection Secretariat, and it is working in training processes aimed at including a gender perspective in the current police forces and to include practical tools that may improve the efforts for, for peace and security. We know that the problems that women are facing both adults, adolescents, such as mm, discrimination and violence are the true cause of the manifestations and they require an all-encompassing, uh, addressing them from an all-encompassing point of view. The roadmap in order to advance in an articulated manner for the Mexican government is the National Programme for Equality between Men and Women 2024. So it was created by means of a participatory consultation process and it was published in December 2020, establishing the national policy in this regard. We are aware of the relevance of these feminist groups and how important they are in ensuring the rights of women and girls, then a priority, one of the priorities is to foster the democratic and effective and responsible participation of the different sectors of the civil society in the prevention of violence against women and girls. The action lines foster articulation and strengthening of the social movements, social collectives that are working for the promotion of equality of gender and political participation. They go against discrimination and violence against women, girls and adolescents. In addition, it makes it makes consultation fora so that they can foster organized participation of women when planning, developing, or making the assessment of different actions. On the other hand, in terms of the stigmatization of the feminist protests, Eli Mujeres has urged communication media and the society to respect the right of women to participate and to listen to their protests that bring visibility to the inequalities that they are experiencing. In this case, Pro Igualdad fosters the implementation of the convention uh, to fight violence against women in public and private communication media. They also try to have social communication strategies that will foster the participation of women, girls, and adolescents with a territorial and a cultural approach. Eli Mujeres creates interinstitutional coordination for the compliance of the specific actions created in Pro Igualdad, not only for raising awareness of the impact that these discrimination actions may have or violent actions may have against women, but also to ensure the protection of their rights, acknowledging a key role for the stability and peace with the aim of fostering a greater participation of women in reconstruction processes for the social fabric at a local and community level and from a prevention point of view for violence against women and creation of peace, in 2019, Eli Mujeres, together with the Executive Secretariat of the National Public Security System, fostered uh, the creation of networks. This strategy aims at establishing women's networks at a local level, thus enabling to help with the state instances when preventing violence against women by means of all-encompassing strategies that help us identify risk factors, possible violence situations, to know equal, to foster equality between men and women, to create areas that are free of violence and to promote a culture of peace. In the, within the framework of this prevention, the system in order to address and eradicate violence against women has fostered an all-encompassing model that aims at transforming the social and cultural patterns in a coordinated manner between the community and the different the different stages of the government, eradicating the factors that create violence against women in different modalities and in different places. The model fosters the fact that public uh, officials will comply with their obligations, their 
constitutional obligations in terms of prevention of violence against women, and it fosters the participation of the, commun the communication media in promoting the respect for women's rights and eradication of violence against them, specifically in terms of uh, the participation of women and adolescents in public protests based on the constitutional principle of the main interest of children, the Mexican state is working to promote your rights and to develop young people by means of public policies for with a multidisciplinary approach that include that foster inclusion in a social, economic and cultural aspect in that country. Thank you so much. A la representación del Estado. Le voy a dar la palabra al señor Guillermo Fernández. Thank you, States representatives. Now I will give the floor to the UN representative. Good afternoon. I would like to greet the authorities of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, the representatives of the state and the civil society. It is an honor to participate in this hearing as the Mexican representative of the Office of the High Commissioner of the UN for Human Rights to share information informally without being under oath on the situation of the human rights of women and girls within the context of protests in Mexico. None of these comments should be understood as a renounce of the privileges obtained by the UN in the Convention of 1946. The right to participate freely and safely in manifestations, meetings, and protests is a, a core element of democratic life. Exerting the, exercising these rights is specifically relevant for those who have historically faced marginalization and exclusion, as is the case of women and young girls. Protests have been a vital tool to make progress in the human rights agenda, and the large majority of these protests are peaceful or have minor incidents. I will now share part of what was documented by our office in 2020 and 2021. Within this period, women and girls have um, led some of the most massive protests in Mexico uh, in, on, May, on March 8th to fight for justice, uh, for femicides, the disappearance of women, and uh, sexual violence. And most of the, the, the reaction of the government led to the violations of multiple human rights explained in the disproportionate and arbitrary use of the force, arbitrary detentions, tortures, mistreatment, sexual violence, stigmatization, and criminalization. The testimonies of the victims uh, show a sexist, misogynistic um, act behavior and um, aggressions for going beyond traditional gender roles. These aggressions have also affected journalists covering the manifestations who have been victims of physical and verbal gender-based attacks. One of the most meaningful cases was the judicial action of the protest of uh, November in 2020 in Cancun, where the authorities fired at the people and actually hurt two women. But these protests, um, the repression takes uh, place in ma several manners. In one case, the government cut the electricity and the water of a public building, which was occupied by women. So they also, um, they also ob obstacleized their access to hygiene. And all of these contributes the, to the stigmatization of these groups. Now, instead of protecting women against violence, they use the state power against them when they protest on the streets. The presence of Human rights organizations is essential for uh, preventing acts of violence. That is why we find it so concerning that there are attacks like the one of the Human Rights Commission in Quintana Roo against this commission because they adopted precautionary measures in favor of these women. And this led to a joint pronouncement by our office and the Mexican Federation 
and the National Commission for Human Rights. Also in Guanajuato, the police detained in the middle of a manifestation of a protest, a peaceful protest, a member of the National Committee for Human Rights. And even though these uh, actions are public, there has been no accountability. Most of the cases are closed without proof or the authorities decide to investigate minor crimes. Women, apart from being victims of these violations, usually face serious challenges in receiving attention and reparations with a gender perspective. And we must point out that this proportionate attack of the stigmatization and restrictions and the repression against women girls and adolescents, because this violence also affects their condition of gender. These actions um, generate fear and um, this restrain them from attending these protests. And this, of course, perpetuates the situation. And it, this is shown in the joint pronouncement issued by our offices. I'm sorry, but um, his connection seems to be uh, having some problems. That is why uh, we call the states to protect women, to define protocols for protests and defend gender perspective in police proceedings. Deepening these initiatives and ensuring their continuity is a good opportunity to ensure the rights of women and girls to protest. Finally, we believe that authorities could do what the following men could perform the following measures, recognizing the legitimacy of the protests and refrain from Um, stigmatizing them, ensuring the respect to the principles that defend uh, girls and women. The government should also investigate human rights violations. Guillermo, we are having connectivity problems. We cannot hear you and is it not is it better now uh, it is better now but um to strengthen the presence of uh, public agencies for human rights at protests so that they can analyze the activities and the respect of the authorities to address the causes of discrimination and structural violence faced by women by the municipal authorities in particular. And these officials should know what their obligations are and uh, they should meet them. Now it's the turn of the Inter-American Commission. I will start by asking the country rapporteur, Esmeralda Arosemena, do you have any comments or questions? Thank you, Commissioner. Well, there is an acknowledgement of the reality in terms of the um, stigmatization, the harassment, uh, in terms of the participation in protests of um, girls and women, the state has presented the programs, the progress, which are addressed at reaching at, at not only training public officials, but also um, at generating awareness, at generating culture in the recognition of women and girls, first of all, to live free of violence. And secondly, as all human beings, their right to participate their right to their freedom of expression. And I would like to ask the state in this 
development of these programs and your policies, your training centers, etc. Um, is this institutional articulation? In this artic institutional articulation, have you assessed? Um, have you monitored the um, progress of these programs? Are, are they being fruitful? Are they being effective with regards to uh, this issue? And my question is because there are regulations, as we have heard, that contradicts or that is an objective in the ex sorry it's an obstacle in the um, exercise of these rights the regulation of the protest is it generating this possibility of an effectiveness in the institutional articulation that is completely necessary to address this citizen's demand. Because otherwise, you can have a lot of training sessions, a lot of information, but the normative, is it efficient? Or should it be reviewed so that it's adjust, uh, adjusted to all the things we have said and all the things we have heard at this hearing. That is my question for the state, but for the civil society, I would like to know if you have in this participation of girls, I don't know if at school, at the school, these girls were counted as teenagers or adolescents, or maybe they are younger, but I would like to know if you also have made an assessment of those omissions, that absence of a specialized, strengthened attention that girls and adolescents who take part in these protests Because they are they receiving special strengthened attention because we are hearing about uh, the institutions that are responsible for this. That is why I'm asking the state about the articulation, but I would like to know if within the context of the protests, have you made this assessment about the response for girls and adolescents? That's all I have to say. Thank you, Commissioner. Now I will give the floor to Commissioner Piovesan. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. Let me start by greeting the civil society, which is very well represented by these brave organizations for their commitment to the cause of the human rights of women and girls to gender equality. I would also like to greet the state, its representatives, Ambassador Luz, the um, representative Guillermo Maldonado from the UN. I would like to share, first of all, my concern with regards to what we have heard within the framework of feminist protests for reproductive rights, for sexual rights in Mexico. And we're talking about women, girls fighting for their rights, for justice. And we have heard very strong testimonies about physical violence, criminalization, intimidation, threats, sexual violence in 10 different states. I wrote this down, physical, psychological, sexual violence, the arbitrary use of the force, arbitrary detentions, and for the inter-American system, 
freedom of expression. We have our rapporteur here who is an expert in this topic, but for us, this is the pillar of the cornerstone of the cornerstone of democracy. There's no democracy without a right to protest, and there is no right to protest and freedom of expression without democracy. So for the state, I have two questions. I understand because I also live in a federal state. I understand the challenges, but from the perspective of international law, the responsibility lies with the national state. Separation of the, of the branches of power, that's the reason to um, make the state accountable. So I would like to understand how will it develop in a digital, sorry, in a diligent manner with a gender approach, all of the reports about the excessive use of force within the context of the protests against women and adolescents and girls, and also the undue use of criminal um, law, preemptive and arbitrary detentions without due process. My second question, well, here we um, saw what the um, civil society mentioned in its criticism of the National Act on the Use of the Force and the exercise by the security forces and the police in an arbitrary manner. In terms of the principle of proportionality, we have, we, Mr. Guillermo even told us about cases of the use of lethal weapons, fire weapons. I would like to understand from the state's perspective, and as, as Ms. Esmeralda said, what are the proposals? in terms of this instrument, which is the National Act for the Use of the Force. Of course, the state mentioned the training programs, the training courses, but I think that the paradigm of this law is not compatible with the inter-American standards. And I thought it was very important to have external overseeing, to monitor the use of the force by the security forces. And even the court, the independent observatory to have accountability on the use of the force, how the state is, will, how will the state implement this independent observatory in compliance with the court's decision? And how do you see this um, sub external supervision body of the security forces and for the civil society? I have a question. How do you feel as women, as activists? What was the impact of these discourses of stigmatization? Because for the commission, high authorities have an aggregated, aggravated responsibility. But we, when we see stigmatizing discourse by authorities, the impact of the, of these discourses can be terrible. So I would like to know in your experience, what has been the impact of this discourse in terms of the um, intimidation? Um, we're talking about institutional violence. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Before giving the floor to my colleagues at the, um, this executive secretariat and the rapporteur, I have a couple of questions. First of all, I would like to understand that as Commissioner Piovesan said, uh, freedom of expression and the right to protest is a cornerstone of democracy. The truth is that in this case, these are women who are protesting. And these women, this goes beyond freedom of expression because there's a continuity of the violence and gender-based violence. So my first question is for the civil society. Um, regardless of these actions you have shared, this um, I'm talking about now uh, vengeance acts that uh, girls or adolescents may have suffered at school 
or um, by their families? Have they, been, have they been punished by their parents, for example? And then do you have more detailed information about the specific reports made during the protests? And what was the state's response? And then for the state, I also celebrate the information you have provided about the workshops and the courses, but I have a question. Apart from these uh, workshops, do you have not gender workshops, but basic training programs, uh, training programs with a gender approach, not just a workshop? And do you have what kind of sanctions can uh, appear or particular situations in case gender based violence occurs? in this case, in, occur in this case against women and girls who are protesting. And along the same lines, I would like to um, remind the state's due diligence duty. In the Campo Algodonero case, as we saw, Cotton Field, there's um, a reinforced duty for women and um, girls. But of course, these makes the state more accountable. So it needs to be more vigilant. Now I would like to ask Ms. Pulido if she has any questions, Maria Claudia. Yes, thank you. First Vice President, I would like to greet everyone who is in this hearing. From our side, I only have something to tell you. The commission has been working, has been following up on the situation of citizen security and the specific topic of the participation of the civil society in democratic spaces and the state response to that kind of exercise of their citizenship rights. The commission issued a report of in local visit con conducted in 2015 in Mexico, and it has continued making a follow up to the recommendations year after year in chapter five of the annual report. Right now, the commission is working on that chapter. We've sent a letter asking for information um, to the Mexican state about each of the recommendations. And this hearing is very important indeed because it is. Uh, it will update the information about whether these recommendations are implemented or not. So my specific question would be, which are the points that you consider the Commission should be focused on at the time of making the compliance assessment of the recommendations by the Mexican state? Thank you very much. I give you back the floor. Thank you. So the last few minutes, maybe I can even give you one more minute to the rapporteur for freedom of expression. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Esmeralda, Piovesan. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you and the rest of my colleagues from the Executive Secretariats, representatives of the UN and members of the civil society for all the information that you've shared with us. First of all, I would like to tell you that the trainings and the awareness spaces for the society, we need to celebrate those areas because it is necessary, but it is not enough. If it is an action that it is not harmonized and that does not go hand in hand with other actions by the state. In this hearing, we mentioned when talking about stigmatizing a narrative or rhetoric, it implies that there is a second intention in the protests. And I think that that can distort the final goal of this training. So a very special call for um, moving forward in the agenda of what has been said during this hearing, so that from now on in the future, the official answer to the protests will also be an ensuring kind of rhetoric or narrative because for the different parts of the state that are addressing these protests, mainly police forces, with a training, like with these trainings, 
there is never any kind of stigmatization meant. They, they are trying to protect the manifestation and not to do any stigmatization. And I would like to talk about the joint declaration or statement with the rapporteurs, my rapporteur's office and the freedom of expression that is aimed at the discourse of the main authorities of the government, because in their discourse, they have either the warranties for freedom of expression or they can become, they can vulnerate their rights. And I think that that's something else important to bear in mind. I think it is also important to mention the attention given to these protests. There is a subordination to the civil power by the police power, the police forces. And that implies that the police actions are very, uh, can be tracked. That's why the first question is how, how many levels of trackability do you have in terms of police actions? And then in terms of, in terms of the protests, the standards of the commission put as a priority the dialogue. It is important, therefore, to ask about the dialogue instances that you have about the vindication of these demonstrations and what is the institutional instance or instances by means of which the state wants to find or to foster the dialogue and which one do you think is more feasible or, or better to be used? And finally, safeguarding uh, the safeguards after the claims of abuse, I would like to ask the state, which is an estimated time in which we could make a follow up for the advance of these investigations and sanctions of what has been mentioned here, as well as which are the safeguards implemented um, in terms of criminal law by the simple fact of participating in a money in demonstration, because this because this aspect is also important to be addressed. And then building trust, building trust within that protest, whether it is uh, physical, like in person or virtual, that it will be free of violence against women. Thank you. Thank you, Rapporteur. So now I'll give the floor to the civil society for 10 minutes. Okay, so I will take the floor, if I may. Answering something that the state mentioned before in terms of the fact that took place on November the 9th, 2020 in Cancun, Quintana Roo. In the case of the repression, sexual torture that took place on that date, we want, we wish to highlight and urge the state that they need to acknowledge that all the women arrested were victims of sexual violence and they are not investigating the gender crimes. They are making omissions, there are, viol there are violations to the due diligence in order to analyze sexual torture or in order to arrest the policemen that were involved there. We believe it is very important to highlight that condemning the facts by Conaving is not enough. I mean, it's not a measure that is good enough for repair. And also to highlight how important it is that Conavi will go, will approach each of the victims in addition to what they have stated. They have not all been approached and making the most of this hearing I would like to remind that in July, we presented a request for precautionary measures to the Inter-American Commission, and it was registered as MS61121, dealing with the persecution that the victims have, have felt, have experienced. They've experienced threats to death and even um, requests to invest to unduly investigate their houses. Therefore, we ask the Inter-American Commission to act upon what we've mentioned. We thank you.
Thank you. I would like to add with the Cancun, something else about the Cancun case, because one of the cases was mentioned here, the Getzali case, and that was a case that we documented where there was a woman that was a victim, uh, for, she was raped. Still, there is no justice done there. Her claim was dismissed as part of the damage to the victims. But there was a case of sexual torture that was not addressed and that was not even acknowledged. It is also important to point out that within the documented cases, and as an answer to what Esmeralda, where Commissioner Esmeralda was saying, yes, there was the presence of girls and adolescents in the social protests, in like the case of Leon in 2020, where there were at least two adolescents that were arrested with no specific measures in order to provide uh, special care because of their age. They were sent to the courts receiving the same treatment as if they were adults. So they were there, for example, they spent the whole night in that place and they received insults and comments um, like machist comments by policemen and threats of some kind of physical aggression towards them. I would also like to point out that throughout this year, the aggression has continued during the protests. We mentioned the case of Querétaro in the video where we could see a criminalization to protests where after the events happened they remove responsibilities and or they apply um, they criminalize them because of damage to the to some of the structures in the public in the public sphere and there was another example of a breastfeeding woman and the impact that it had on the communication media they were criminalized and they were stigmatized even more and they received some comments um undermining their uh, right to go to these protests as she was breastfeeding thank you I would like to thank all the commissioners because of the questions that you've posed in terms of the impact that this discourse has had and this context has had. I would like to point out two main topics that the representative of the high commissioner of the high commissioner of the UN has already mentioned and it is related to the task of the female journalists that are covering this this demonstration or protests in Quintana Roo one of the journalists who was hurt by, by a shot she was shot <coughs> during the repression same as many female journalists, they go to these demonstrations with their children, daughters or sons. She was with um, her son and he had, he's an autist and she was there with her other daughter as well. Imagine the reaction at the time of the shot. So this impact has been very hard because she, was trying to raise her voice and to broadcast the repression that took place in Quintana Roo, but neither her daughter or her son received any psychological help or care. And in addition to this, there is a lack of justice. And I think that that's very important to point out here, the due diligence in terms of investigation. On April 21 this year, the attorney's office of Quintana Roo reported to the victims of November that they couldn't locate any of the policemen that took place in the Quintana Roo repression because they couldn't find them. They were not uh, easy to localize or they didn't know who they were or where they were. And I think that this is just an example of this context that makes the aggressions repeated over and over and this goes again against feminist protests in particular and something else these demonstrations are, re are 
and are becoming less and less in this context because of the fear of being attacked. This is what's happening in Quintana Roo, the fear that the repression created on them, the use of force against them. So that made the feminist movement to hush and to stay quieter. Same thing as journalists. The people who go to check on, fem on the feminist demonstration are also female journalists who suffer this stigmatization as well whenever they are questioning or whenever they are posing questions about human rights of women, as we've seen uh, in the recent cases. So this is also mm, the task and this is the impact that is created. Thank you. Okay, so just to wrap up and by thanking you for your questions, the questions posed by all the commissioners, I would like to repeat what we said before, the importance of all the trainings, but mainly that they are not enough. They haven't managed to revert the patterns and they cannot do so if the strategy is still militarized as it is as it currently in and as the commission knows and as long as they do not become any as as long as they don't get any accountability or control and as long as the aggressions that we've heard will continue thus avoiding their further participation. We celebrate the presence of CONAVIM representatives, of ASIM Mujeres representatives, because it shows how important it is, but this goes, needs to go hand in hand with controls that will take that will be implemented before, during and after the demonstration, the restriction for the use of weapons and the analysis of torture and sexual torture, which is extremely serious. And we repeat the importance of establishing measures that are established in previous inter-American rulings, such as, for example, the use of force in, with Atenco, and in order to see the trackability of the police forces, as it was also pointed out by the representative of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, there are no investigations conducted because of the abuses, no leaders of the police forces are investigated, and they are not complying either with any of the obligations that are included in, in the codes for the use of force. So, for example, they are not even issuing reports so that they can conduct further investigations later on. Even the National Guard received a um, resolution by the night that forces them, urges them to give a public report of these events that could be used to assign accountability to the policemen. And also talking about stigmatization, we want this same narrative that comes from the higher spheres and that they still stigmatize women. So we need to focus on that and we can see that a lot in these institutions. We know that there are different levels of accountability, but mainly in this kind of per state perspective, it is important that these elements will comply with the standards and with the um, obligations for this subject. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we will send written information about the legal processes that were mentioned, and we need to mention as well that some of the women are still undergoing criminal processes because of these crimes, and that they themselves had to start uh, litig litigation for so that the police forces can be investigated. So we see the lack of balance in this case. Okay, thank you. And now we'll give the floor to the state for the last 10 minutes. Thank you. The Mexican state acknowledges the demands that young women show in order to ask for a life free of violence. And we are working in order to ensure the free manifestation and protests and peaceful gathering of women and young girls as a result of the right for freedom of expression, as well as the right to get together, uh, uh, recognized and acknowledged in our constitution, as well as acknowledged in different international instruments that Mexico is a party to. I would like to mention in the same order of participation to give the order to give the floor to the uh, to our speakers. We have nine more minutes to participate.
Alma Delia. Hi. Good afternoon. We should uh, point out that for the security for uh, citizenship's protection, uh, we have always focused on professionalizing our members and we have always trained them and provided them with technical information on gender equity and human rights. This is all part of our training programs that are continuously um, given to uh, new employees and also veteran employees. We cover concepts, human rights implementation, the use of the force and gender, and gender perspective. We also focus on children and the prevention of torture, migration, attention to victims, legal detentions, among others, and of all of these with an emphasis on the use of force. Our secretariat repeats its position to focus on dialogue and peace and not the use of the force as enshrined in our constitutional, in constitution, international treaties, our national act on the use of the force and other treaties. We also pay attention to whatever ad adjustments are suggested by the court and the legislative branch. And it is important to remember that there's full respect to protesters. Thank you, Mr. Santillan. Conadin. Uh, thank you for your questions and reflections. First of all, I'd like to point out that as a Mexican state, we recognize the excessive use of the force in the events occurred in Quintana Roo, in Guanajuato, Ciudad Juarez, Querétaro, and others, because they violate human rights and the right to protest by women. We would also like to say that at Conavin, um, we have a permanent project on uh, permanent monitoring on events that affect the security, the safety of women. And we act based on that as soon as these uh, things took place, we made this public and we also discussed it with the local authorities. Also, in terms of the articulation of the government's efforts, we created technical rooms for justice access in 23 entities of the Republic, where we are constantly reviewing these facts and violence in general against women and young girls. We are also working strongly in prevention, especially through the extension of uh, services so that women can receive legal and psychological assistance. In Mexico, one out of four municipalities have an alert for gender-based violence, and we coordinate this effort in uh, security and prevention and reparation measures. We have requested the High Commissioner of the UN for his assistance to establish the observatory on the use of force as um, requested by the uh, ATECO ruling. And also, as we have already said, it is not enough with training. There should be supervision, monitoring and assistance. It is not enough for a woman to dress or to wear a police uniform to say that we have uh, a gender approach in the police. That is not enough. We need police agents who are aware of their due diligence with a gender perspective and implement it. We firmly believe that and we will permanently assist women in this country and in particular, those who suffer violence in any expression or manifestation. Thank you. Ms. Gassman, thank you very much for your questions. 
once again, we, the Mexican state recognizes the legitimate demands of women, girls, and young women um, to live a violence-free life. And we have been working in a coordinated manner to promote dialogue and to change these practices that we all recognize as practices that do not represent what the Mexican government is trying to build. And I would like to uh, set the example, responding to the question we were asked by Commissioner Flavia Piovesan in terms of the of federalism, this important and complex issue. After the events that took place in Quintana Roo and within a framework between the institutions, it was decided to create a preventive, preemptive strategy. So the uh, Secretariat for Government, the Secretariat for Public Safety, and the National Institute for Women, along with CONAVI, before the protests of November 25th that year, we all met with all the secretaries of public security to talk about the issue, to talk about the importance of the right to protest of these persons, of these women. We also held a meeting with all the human rights commissions in the States so that they would provide support and they would safeguard the freedom of expression of the protesters. And we also established a dialogue between the Secretariat for Public Security and the organizations that are usually present at these protests, as Luciana Gomez Malabud was, Bunta was mentioning, to create a closer relationship between public, the public security of the states and the civil society organizations. This first step led to what our colleagues at the Secretariat for Public Security reported in terms of the preparation before these protests. And we will continue to work with the Secretariat for Public Security and the Sec Secretariat for Government in order to ensure that these spaces are violence-free, that these incidents no longer take place so that we can keep on building these spaces for uh, dialogue, respect, and freedom of expression. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're reaching the end of this hearing. I would like to thank the participation of each of you. I would like to thank Mr. Guillermo Fernandez Madonado for being here, um, the representatives of the state, and without a doubt to the organizations of the civil society, but also the persons you are representing. And I always say that I thank you not only for being here, but for your daily work. But in this particular case, I would like to thank and acknowledge this in particular, because even though this is a hearing out about freedom of expression and the right to protest, in the specific case of the rights of women, all of these rights were fundamentally obtained via protest, divorce, vote, university. None of these rights were taken for granted. They didn't come out of the thin air. This was the result of the fight of women. And this has always happened and will continue to happen tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, where we will continue to see fights for rights. And speaking about uh, Mexico, where the first UN comes, uh, conference was held in the International Year of Women. And we always say that Commissioner Piovesan, I am the first vice president and president uh, Antonia Urrejola, it is the first time 
the board of the commission is made up of women. And that would have never happened without the protest of women fighting and for their rights. And I, as I was talking to all of you, I was looking at the delegation of the state, which is made up in its majority by women. So thank you to who are, and who are there in part, thank you, thanks to all the women who fought for their rights. And that fight, that protest, the commission appreciates the willingness of the state. Uh, and of course, we are at your disposal of well, uh, as well to provide technical assistance because girl, uh, older women are those young girls who could not protest because they didn't have the possibilities. But it is thanks to those protests of women that would now be the new ones can protest. Thank you so much. Have a nice afternoon. Bye, thank you. Saludo, un gusto. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Gracias. Hasta luego.